Welcome. We are so glad to have you with us. Whether you're streaming this live or you're catching it later via the wonder of the World Wide Web, we're, we're glad. And if you're, if you're joining us from far away and you haven't yet said ch- hey in the chat room, please, please go ahead and, and do that. Let us know who's here. I, I was in the, the chat room while we were waiting for everything to get started, and it, it's, it's a fun way to get connected. But man, what a season we're in. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit before the service about the complications that we've experienced. Now, it wasn't too long ago that, that I went down to the Dominican Republic for spring break and things started to go sideways. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to know which one of you is actually responsible for this. It's like somebody forgot to enter the numbers on the computer in the hatch. So many of us have had to deal with disappointments from missed graduations to funerals that have had to be postponed to to weddings that had to scramble to figure out how to get that online. Uh, I'm sure that by now those of you who live in Happy Valley have have heard about the Big Ten deciding to postpone all of their fall sports for 2020 and 2021 and that directly affects us here in in ways other than not getting to cheer for our our favorite football team. Um, It seems like every day we're, we're discovering new ways to be discouraged. So l- let me just turn that, flip that script a little bit and remind you that we've got to look for some silver linings in the middle of all the corona craziness. And one of the upsides for our family, for Team Sublet, has been our family meal times. I, I know that might not be the case for, for you, but, but for us and for my wife in particular, for Kim, there is nothing better than having a full house around the table for a meal. She loves to cook. She does a great job with that. And we've got a big family. For those of you who don't know, we have nine kids. And, and with uh, some of them living outside of the house, there are roommates involved and, and there's a girlfriend involved. And, and it doesn't get better for us, especially for Kim, than to have everybody in the house, food on the table, conversations going all over the place. I mean, one of our family hallmarks is that everybody talks and nobody listens, and that's okay. Uh, we, we've had more time, we've discovered that because of the, the, the way the world is right now, we've had more time to be together, and that's led to some great conversations and a depth of relationship that we didn't even know we were missing. You know, Jesus had a thing for meals, too. Uh, if you follow him through the New Testament, you'll, you'll regularly see him showing up at mealtime. Th- there's that wedding in Cana, and there are at least two times, two times recorded in Scripture, that he, he fed huge numbers of people with just the, the most meager supplies. He, he had meals with friends and meals with the religious leaders of the day. He, he even had meals with his enemies. In the book of Luke alone, there are ten stories of Jesus sitting down to eat with various people. And, and one of the passages that we're going to look at today, the main passage we're going to look at today, happens in the book of Luke and takes place at a banquet, a dinner party. And I'm going to start with the end, just so you know where we're headed. I'll tell you the, the end of the story, and, and, and let's see where it goes from there. But God loves a full table, and, and there's still room at the Father's table. This is week four of our still sermon series. And if you've missed any of the previous sermons, messages, I would really encourage you to go back and catch up on those because they're they're worth the listen. They'd be worth your time. Each of the first three had something to do with the idea of us being still. But today's different. Today we're going to take a look at the idea that there's still room at the Father's table. And yes, even in the middle of the corona chaos, I believe that God intends for us to live along this line of belief and action. In fact, I'm going to ask you to consider the fact that God might actually be using this present crisis to move his people toward his plan. To get us started, let me give you a little context for the passage we're going to look at. We're in Luke chapter 14, and in this chapter, Jesus has been invited to a banquet at the home of a Pharisee, a dinner party, a Sabbath meal. That's kind of a big deal. Now, this is not the first meal that Jesus shared with the religious leaders of the day, but by this point in his timeline, Jesus 
he's not on the good list. He, he's, he's had a history of speaking against the religious leaders, of pointing out their hypocrisy, their inconsistencies with God's ways. And at this dinner, he, he, not only does he do it once, once would be enough, but, but he goes out of his way four times to poke at them. First of all, he heals a man on the Sabbath, which was forbidden, and, and, and does it not only, he does it in the room with them there watching. And then, then he, he, he pokes at them about uh, the, their pride and, and choosing seats at the table based on their, uh, their position, their rank. And, and then he talks about, he confronts them about the people that they invite to their dinner parties. And then there's a story that we're going to look at today. It starts in verse 15. One of the remarkable things about Jesus is that he's not afraid to push people's buttons. His goal in every interaction was to to cause people to think, to push them to remember the kingdom, and to nudge people back to the purposes of God. That's what he did then, and, and that's what the Holy Spirit does now. He calls us to repent where we've been wrong and to return to what God wants. So, Here's the first thing that I want you to, to, to learn from all of this. Here's one of the main overarching thoughts in all of this. I, I want you to see that, that my house, your house, can be ground zero for a kingdom infection. Some of you, some of you just winced. I, I know it. Some of you just said, ew. Maybe that's the wrong terminology. Maybe that's the wrong way to think about it. But maybe, maybe this is a better way. Maybe, maybe you should think, my house can be the place that the kingdom of God breaks into my neighborhood. Your front yard, your back porch, your kitchen table can be the place where the kingdom of heaven touches the earth, where light and life break into the darkness, where hope is found and hurts are healed. You see, long before the church Hmm. Long before the church of Jesus had, had pulpits and place spaces, she had fire pits and kitchen tables. And long before the church was housed in a structure, the structure of the church was a house. Your home could be the next place that the kingdom, the church of Jesus, breaks into this world. And it starts with hospitality. L- listen to these words. Jesus said, when When one of those uh, who reclined at the table heard him say these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus said, this guy was talking about a banquet in heaven. He was saying how great it's going to be when there's that banquet in heaven. Jesus said, a man once gave a banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Sets the table and invites people. In his book, The Simplest Way to Change the World, uh, Dustin Willis writes, For many of us whose lives feel ordinary, being part of God's mission to reverse the curse on creation and introduce those who are far away from God to a really close relationship with him, that mission feels unattainable, impracticable, (laughs) impractical, and overwhelming. Can you relate to that? We've given up hope, he says, that we can actually change the world. Because when? When could we even do that? There there isn't a whole lot of time left between waking up, rushing to work. Okay, some of you are not rushing to work these days. Eating meals and preparing for the next day. We get that, right? We feel that pinch. But he goes on to ask this question. What if you could actually change the world right from your own home? What if you already have access to the ultimate game-changing secret weapon? What if the secret weapon for gospel advancement is actually hospitality? Now, these days, more than ever, we feel this longing, this desperate need for some kind of meaningful connection, some face-to-face interaction. We live in a world that's increasingly divided, and the awareness of that division is everywhere we look. No matter what you believe about racism and Black Lives Matter, about politics, about LGBTQ, about masks, immunizations, about businesses shutting down and schools not starting, about Big Ten football. If you have an opinion and you're bold enough to share it on social media, somebody's going to take a shot at you. Division is everywhere. This is a tough time to be a human being. 
We all need a safe space to be. Your home, your home can be that safe place for people to connect, to find community, to share a meal, to share life together. You can carve out space in your neighborhood that gives your neighbors the opportunity to breathe, to relax, to take a load off. Just be. That's the hospitality heart of God. Western hospitality has, has taken on the, the flavor of inviting a few close friends into our home for a brief period of time where we put our best foot forward and, and we hope for a night of good conversation. But let's be honest. That's not hospitality. That's entertaining friends. The, the Eastern church did a better job of this. And, and for centuries, they practiced the art of hospitality where they would take strangers into their home and give them a safe place to stay, give them a seat at the table, and make sure that they're taken care of. But God's hospitality goes even beyond that. God's hospitality takes enemies, transforms that relationship, and brings them into a place so that they're actually family. Now, I'm not sure what's going on. I feel like I can't move. Do you need to give me a, a different mic? Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. That's what happens when we try to go live. Should I just keep talking? Okay. I, I doubt that m many of you really have neighbors that you would classify as enemies. I really, honestly doubt that. And there may be some few oddballs in your neighborhood. Thanks, Lil. It's my lovely daughter, Lily. There, there may be a few people in your neighborhood that are extra grace required. You know what that is, right? It's, it's those people that you just have to, they need a little bit more space. They need a little bit more grace. And my guess is that somebody immediately pops to mind when I, when I say that phrase. And if, if nobody immediately pops to mind, you may be the person who is extra grace required in your neighborhood. Anyway, um, your home could be the place, that sacred space, that secret weapon for the kingdom of God to break through into your neighborhood. So let me ask you this. Who could you show hospitality to, God's hospitality to, this week? Think about your neighbors. On that list of your neighbors, who could you show hospitality from a kingdom perspective to this week? Well, back to the story. And, and right off the bat, things did not go the way the host expected. No sooner had the call been made, y'all come and get it, food's on the table the excuses began to, to roll in. And, and they came from everyone. Jesus says they came from everyone who was invited. I don't know what this guy did, who, who he offended, or, or why he made them so mad that nobody wanted to come eat his food, but that's what happened. And Jesus says that we should expect excuses. Listen to his words. He says, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field and must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I bought five uh, yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I, I get that one. Actually, I do, I do get that one. The excuses started to roll in. I had a football coach in high school who used to say, excuses are like noses. Everybody's got one, and they all smell. Jesus says that they began to make excuses. Sorry, Charlie, I can't make it. Something suddenly came up. And every person on the party list declined the invitation. And, and while I know that's just a, it's just a story that Jesus told, one of the simple truths that we see here is that when we try to show hospitality and invite others in, when we don't have a great relationship with them, we're likely to experience some rejection. Have you ever extended yourself, stepped out, tried, made the invite, and felt the sting of rejection? My guess is you have. Nobody likes that feeling. But here's the thing. Problems don't prevent progress. And when you run into obstacles and bumps in the road, we're going to have to figure out a way to keep moving toward the goal. And if the goal is to build relationships, if the goal is to love your neighbor, spoiler alert, it is. 
If the goal is to love your neighbor, then you can't let a little rejection stand in your way. You can't give up when the excuses roll in. And and some of the responses are going to be just that, nothing more than a flimsy excuse to avoid getting together. But some of the rejections, some of the responses are going to come from a lack of trust. People don't know that they can trust you. And some of them are going to come because somewhere in their past, there was a wound, there was a hurt, there was someone who represented Jesus or someone who represented the church hurt that person, hurt your neighbor, and it soured them toward your, your invitation. And if that's the case, there's only one thing we can do, only one course of action. You pray for the Lord to heal that hurt and you work to begin the relation, to rebuild the relationship. We may have to apologize for things that we didn't do in order to move forward. We might not be responsible for the hurt, but we can offer an apology and a hand in friendship. If we want to make, if we want to truly love our neighbors, we may have to take baby steps and repent from mistakes and missteps in the past. We may have to humble ourselves and seek forgiveness and reconciliation. We may have to do some of the hard work, the heart work, to mend broken trust and let God heal that relationship. In our effort to build relationships with the people who live around us, we may have to unlearn some of the ways that we've responded to people who think and live and act differently than we do. Jesus isn't finished with his story. He goes on to lay out one of the foundational truths of the table of God. And this is what I told you at the beginning. There's still room for more. So the servant, back to Luke chapter 14, the servant came and reported these things to his master, and the master of the house became angry and said to the servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, check, sir, we've what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. I love that line. The master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, urge people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. That's a hard word right there. The master of the house is angry. He is fired up, but he doesn't call off the party. Jesus repeats a line that he's already spoken in this banquet, in, in, in the, the listening ears of the people who were there, he already talked about inviting the, the poor and crippled and blind and lame. This is the second time he uses that phrase. There are peop- those are the people who wouldn't ordinarily be invited to this party. Those are the people who could never repay the hospitality of the host. The servant's one step ahead of him in Jesus' story. He says, we already did that, sir, and there's still room. So the master makes a split-second decision and changes his whole approach to the celebration. He sends the servant out to the highways and the hedges and tells him, beg the people, urge the people, plead with the people, compel them to come in that my house may be full. More important than having the right people at the table the, the, the master of the house wants a full table. Jesus is saying that the table of the Father has always got room for more people, and they don't have to be deserving. They don't have to be qualified. They don't have to be the kind of person who would normally get invited to the table. And here's the thing. That's us. That's who we were. We were those who were on the outside, undeserving and uninvited, separated from the family of God and without a seat at the table. That's who we were. But the Father was unwilling to write us off as lost forever. So he sent his son, Jesus, to restore our relationship, to offer us forgiveness, healing, and a seat at the table. Some of us, I think, have forgotten that. Some of us have forgotten who we were and where we are now and how we got there. Barry Switzer, some of you may know Barry Switzer's name. He, he, he was a famous football coach uh, from Oklahoma and the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, he, he was a quote machine. I mean, he said things all the time that people remember. But one of the things that he said is some of the people are born on third base and they go through life thinking that they hit a triple. And while none of us were born worthy of a seat at the table of God, every one of us it would do well to remember that it's by God's grace and his love that's been lavished on us that we find ourselves at the table of all. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. 
Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 when he's sending them out. He says, go and announce that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, cast out demons. And then he says this, give as freely as you have received. He says there's still room. There's still room. The simple truth here is that we've been loved and invited. We have been pursued. And when we live into that principle, when we begin to practice what Jesus taught his followers, we have to ask ourselves, how does that play out in our lives, in our neighborhoods? So take a moment and imagine the place you live. Picture the folks who live and work and play around you. Think about the grace that you've received and then ask yourself this question, who Should I pursue? Who should I pursue? One of the kingdom principles that we've got to lean into is the idea, the fact that God loves a full house. That might not mean what you think it means. I used to think that when when I read that, when I heard that idea, he was talking about Sunday morning church services being packed. I'm not sure that that's what Jesus means. You've, you've heard this from Pastor Dan in recent days. God's not looking for fans in the stands. Those words land a little differently this week, don't they? There, there's another football coach. I'm quoting a lot of football coaches, and interestingly enough, he's also from Oklahoma. Uh, but his name was Bud Wilkinson, and he... He, he won three national championships at Oklahoma back in the 50s, 14 conference titles. Before, between 1953 and 1957, his Oklahoma football teams won 47 straight games. That is not too shabby. Coach Bud is the man that's credited with saying this, and I, I think you've heard this before too. Football is 22 people on the field in desperate need of rest being watched by 22,000 people in the stands in desperate need of exercise. I think Father God is trying to shake things up and and taking that metaphor of fans in the stands. We at Calvary believe that God is intent on a shift from moving people from fans in a stadium to family at the supper table. That's one of the foundational shifts, that, that transition. This is not a temporary blip on the, the life of the church. This, this, is, this is a transition to something new. God's not looking to fill our facilities with people who watch a team of paid professionals pull off the things that we've come to call the church. That's the way the, the Old Testament temple operated. You had priests and Levites who did all of the stuff and the people just kind of watched. And that's the way that the modern church can be at times. Is that an oversimplification? Is that how I think every, ch- no, that's definitely an oversimplification, but, but the simple truth is, and don't, don't tune me out now, hear this. I know that many folks who call Calvary their home are involved in the mission of God and the ministry of the church, but if we're going to take seriously the idea that God is leading us into a transition, into a new normal, into a different way of approaching how we live out this call to be his people, to be the church, I honestly believe that this is one of the key shifts we're gonna have to make. I think God is stirring the pot, deconstructing how we live out this call, how we currently function, and he's bringing people back to the heart of his mission. Is there a time for and a need for the body to come together for worship, for fellowship, for teaching and prayer and celebration? Absolutely. We're never going to stop doing that. That's never going away. Even in this season, when it's difficult to get together in person, we're finding ways, whether it's outside or in smaller groups, but we're gonna have to find ways to get together. But the purpose of the church, the purpose of the church, the mission of God's people is now and has always been to make disciples, to help people who are disconnected from God find their way back to the table, back to the family of God. And and I honestly don't believe that the best way to do that is through our typical Sunday morning worship service. That's why you hear us putting so much time and effort, so much energy into this idea of our front yard mission. That's why you've been hearing message after message about the mission of God and the importance of, of loving your neighbor. 
the call and command of God to be salt and light where you live, to go into all the world and make disciples. Now, in case it hasn't landed with you, in case this is the first time that you're hearing that phrase or the first time that it's registering with you, let let me highlight what I mean when we say front yard mission. The basic idea is that when Jesus said his followers, his disciples, his people are to love their neighbors, we think he meant that literally. It doesn't mean that you don't love people who are not your neighbors. It just means that he, he meant literally. Let's start there. Let's start Instead of thinking about how you could go halfway around the world, let's start where you live because there's a better chance that the people who live around you think like you. Same experiences, same, uh, you, you share a backyard, your, your kids go to the same school, you shop at the same, same shops, you, you, you root for the same team, unless you root for the Eagles, and, and you've got all of this in common. You live in the same community. These are the people that you can get to know who will shape your life, and in turn, you can shape theirs. We've tried to simplify this as much as possible, to make it accessible for everyone, to give all of us a shot at taking steps to make the mission of God our own. We, we can point you to books and messages from podcasts and webinars to uh, training and tools to help you figure out what this looks like in your life, in your neighborhood. But the basic idea is you want to start with, if you want to start with your front yard mission, you're gonna pray first every day. We've, we've got, uh, we had some cards that had a hashtag, a big tic-tac-toe kind of square looking on it, and encouraging people to pray for their neighbors every day. Write down the name of eight of your closest neighbors and pray for those folks every day. There's a website called Bless Every Home that will, in a non-creepy way, tell you the names of the people who live around you. It's all public information anyway. But it'll tell you their names so that you can begin to pray for them by name. They'll send you an email reminder every day that you want to say, hey, here are the, the names of the people you can pray for every day. Every day, I have taken this and and I put it in my journal. At the when I start a new journal, I create a hashtag card. Don't look at my names, uh, and I I pray for those people every day. They're the people who live around me. And one of the best ways to get after that might be for you to form a triad of people in your neighborhood. Pastor Dan talked about triads last week. Man, th- this would be a great opportunity for you to get connected to some of the other people in your neighborhood. They don't even have to go to Calvary. But to pray together would be tremendous, especially praying in your neighborhood. So pray first and love all. When you're praying for people, you're going to develop a, a burden, a heart burden for people. And, and love is, is not just this idea, this concept. It's not just a mental agreement. It is an action word. When you pray for people, it changes the way you see them. And when you begin to see them differently, you love them. And that moves you to think about them and act towards them in a different way. And that's important. So we pray first, we love all, and we invite often. And to be honest, here's where I think we get stuck a lot. This is the pinch point. A few years ago, we started talking about these ideas, and we thought on, on, at the staff level, we thought it would be really uh, a great idea to encourage people to, to host a backyard barbecue, a block party, a, a neighborhood grill and, and chill kind of, and, and to be honest, we thought it was going to fly. We thought people were going to grab this idea and run with it, and, and some of you might have been ambitious enough to try it, but, but I think that most people were intimidated by the idea because it seemed too big. Maybe you tried it and you experienced some rejection, but it seems like every time we told one of the stories of people who, who tried something like that, instead of it landing with a, oh yeah, we can do that, it, it, it felt like more people were discouraged and, and dis- defeated because they didn't have a big win story like that to share. So, so maybe we didn't get that part right. Um, maybe we, we made it seem like if you didn't have a whole bunch of people respond to your invitation and show up for your block, block party, that you missed it. And if that's the case, I'm sorry. That was not our intent. We really thought it was going to be helpful, and, and maybe it wasn't. I think some of you, it, it didn't land for you the way we hoped it would. So if you'll give me a second chance, I'd like to reset that for us. Let, let me suggest that you start small that you aim to simply invite a few of your neighbors to spend some time 
together. I, I listened to a podcast this week, but there's a guy by the name of Dave Runyon. Dave and Jay wrote this book called The Art of Neighboring. We've used this as uh, kind of a blueprint for the kind of things that we're trying to do here at Calvary. It's where we got the idea for the hashtag for the Pray for Your Eight. Um, and, and there are some really good, good tools in here. If you don't have a copy of this, you, you should grab it. Um, I'm going to ask the tech team to post a link to the the podcast, and to their COVID-19 Art of Neighboring Toolkit. So many good things, simple things, easy things that I think will be helpful for you. Um, you, If you click to the resources page, you'll find all those, but you should listen to the podcast. But let me tell you one of the things that stood out to me from this this podcast. Um, Dave is talking about the fact that he is a natural-born evangelist. He loves sharing the gospel. He's seen some fruit in his life from sharing the gospel with people. But he said, if you expect right out of the gate that, that you're going to knock on someone's door and invite them to come over to your house and, and you're going to have this magical conversation that leads to a conversion and them, them trusting Jesus, you're, you're going to be disappointed. He said, you, you, you just start building relationships. And one of the things that I'm going to try, uh, he, he, he calls it a neighborhood sit-in. What is that? It's, is it like a protest? No, it's just you invite neighbors to bring their lawn chair, snacks, drinks, whatever they want to do, and, and to grab an hour of evening time together. Sit in your, now for us, we, we can do that in our street because our street doesn't get much traffic. I'm going to try this. There are some simple things, but I, I really want to encourage you to start small. It doesn't have to be a big blowout party to count as a win. You don't have to share the gospel with complete strangers right out of the gate for it to be success. You don't have to have a block party or a festival complete with a dunking booth and clowns. Ditch the clowns, keep the dunking booth in order for it to be good. Here's an important question that I think Jesus was leading his listeners to. Who do you want to be in the story? In the story, you've got the people who were originally invited. They're, they're not coming to the party. You've got the servants who were sent out, and you've got the, the people who actually showed up. You've got the, the, the poor and crippled and blind and lame, those people on the edges, at the highways and hedges. I believe this is one of the unasked questions on the heart of Jesus. He actually told this story to a group of people in the hopes that they would change their hearts, that they would hear and respond, that they would change their behavior and their outlook, that they would align themselves with the heart of the Father. Jesus is looking to help fans become followers, right? And he wants followers to to come to the table, to become family, and eventually take over the family business. So my question to you is the same. Who do you want to be in the story? I said it earlier, but the bottom line truth is that there have always been and will always be obstacles, difficulties, pushbacks, and problems. But problems don't prevent progress. Problems don't preempt the purposes of God. That's a lot of P. Problems don't preclude the promises of God to build his church. The mission and purpose of the church are always the same. Go make disciples. If you read through the book of Acts, you see that start to turn in Acts chapter 1. In in verse 8, Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And that's exactly what happened, sort of. The Holy Spirit fell on the early followers of Jesus, and they began to spread the gospel throughout Jerusalem. And it's an amazing history of miracles and salvations and the kingdom breaking into this this world and the explosive growth of the early church. But that's where they got stuck. They never left Jerusalem. Now I asked you earlier, do you think that God might be actually using this present crisis to move people towards his plan? Well, if you read the book of Acts, you see that very thing happen in the history of the church. In a nutshell, while the church was growing and gaining momentum in Jerusalem, in fact, at one point in the story, the the religious leaders of the day complain about the, the, the followers of Jesus saying, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching about him. While it was popular with the people, the religious leaders of the day didn't see eye to eye. And there were situations and there were confrontations with the Pharisees, with the priests, In Acts chapter 7, things come to a boil, and one of the leaders of the church is killed, stoned to death by a mob, and then things go from bad to worse. Acts chapter 8 verse 1 tells us that there arose on that day 
a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Flashback to the words of Jesus. You're gonna be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, the end of the earth. It took a crisis, a great wave of persecution to move the church out of Jerusalem. I'm certain that those days were no fun for the, relig- for the church leaders of the day. It was terrible for the people who were doing their best to follow Jesus. They were scattered. They couldn't meet where they thought they were going to meet. Their lives were disrupted by something out of their control. They were prevented from doing the things that they had come to rely on and know as normal. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Here's what I want us to see, what I hope we can all grab onto. While the mission and purposes of the church are constant, they never change. The methods and practices of the church have to be flexible, have to change with the needs of the season. And it just might be the case that God's doing another one of those Acts 1-8 to Acts 8-1 numbers in our days. There's still room at the table of God. There's still room in the family of God. And some of you have jumped into this. Some of you are praying for your neighbors. You're you're praying for your eight. You're looking for ways to love and serve the people around you. You're stepping out in faith, inviting your neighbors into your lives. You're playing board games together. You're you're working on projects together in in your garages. You're, You're sharing time around a fire pit while your kids hang out together. You're already in. But if If you'd like to take a step toward your front yard mission, toward the mission of God in your neighborhood, I'm gonna ask you to click the link in the chat. Send us a note and let us know. We'll connect you with some of the resources that we've talked about, about how you can take a step toward praying for, loving, and inviting your neighbors into your life. Is it scary? It might be. But we believe that God has a plan to use those of us who will say yes, who will join him where he's already at work, those of us who will follow him in the family business. And if that's you, click that link and say, let me know about Front Yard Mission because I want in. Now, I'm going to pray, and the worship team is going to lead us in another song, and then Pastor Jordan's going to come out and wrap us up with a closing thought. My hope is that you'll take a step, that you'll respond in faith, and that we'll do everything we can to see that the Father's table is full. So let's pray first for all of our neighbors. Let's love the folks who live and work and play around us. Let's go out and invite them, compel them, Jesus says, to come in that the Father's house may be full. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your greatness and your goodness. Thank you for including us in your plan of redemption. Thank you for breaking into our darkness and rescuing us, for giving us life and hope and faith. Thank you for making us part of your family. God, we want to see more people come to know you. We believe that you are the good news, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we're asking you to work in us, to begin to, to bless our neighbors and work in their lives and stir things up so that they sense your presence, so that they have unmistakable evidence of a living God who loves them. We ask that you would move in their lives, that you would cause them to ask questions about the kingdom and help us to love people even the people that we don't like. Help us to love them. Help us to choose to serve them and to pray for them. God, we want to see your kingdom come. We believe that your good news changes people today. It's happened in our lives, and we want it to happen for our neighbors. So we're asking you to pour your spirit out and help us to join you where you're already at work. God, I thank you that that no, no natural disaster, no unforeseen Uh, occurrence, no work of the enemy can stop the growth of the church. Jesus, you promised to build the church and you say the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So let your kingdom come in our neighborhoods as it is in heaven. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.